Our sermon for today, and thank you, Anna, once again for reading the scripture, is entitled Following Jesus. And I want to dedicate today's sermon to the memory of Timuel Black, this being the first Black History Month without a historian that this congregation knew and loved so well. So this sermon is in memory of Timuel Black. The setting of today's scripture is a coastal scene. From the water to the shore, the boats, the nets, the fishermen, the coastal setting of today's lectionary scripture of Luke 5 reminds me so very much of the coastal setting I experienced in Ghana, West Africa, specifically visiting Cape Coast Castle. I was surprised by the setting at the castle that it was located on such a beautiful coastline. And I wasn't sure why I was surprised, maybe because I love coastal scenes. I love lake fronts, ocean fronts, beaches, waves, seashells and rocks, sunshine, and especially the presence of children and families playing in the water. So when we arrived to Cape Coast Castle, and as you can put up that photo of the castle, I'm not sure why I did not expect it to be along a coastline. After all, the transatlantic slave trade happened not by railroad, but by ships crossing the ocean. But I had not thought of this as we arrived to the castle and was surprised the kind of cognitive dissonance when I saw the big white slave castle had a beautiful coastal landscape. The scene was so beautiful that it disturbs me to this day that amidst beautiful scenery, my ancestors and the ancestors of the African diaspora were purchased and captured and held captive worse than cattle until the ships arrived to carry them off to be enslaved, brut brutally enslaved for centuries. And as disturbing as that is, what disturbed me more than the beautiful coastal scenery on which rested Cape Coast Castle was the Christian chapel that rested above the slave dungeon within the castle. Followers of Jesus had indeed been engaging in catching people. Apparently this was their idea of being fishers of men and followers of Christ. And I invite you to breathe deeply with me. You see, we have some serious issues in our society today. And I am one who believes that our problems can be solved if we're willing to solve them. You see, I serve a God that the scripture says can do anything. As a matter of fact, in Genesis 18, 14, God asked Abraham, is there anything too hard for God? To make the point that there is nothing too hard for God. And the prophet Jeremiah exclaimed, ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by the great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. This is my faith foundation that there is nothing too hard for God. And my academic foundation involved a rigorous study of engineering teaching me that all problems can be solved. So you put my faith with my engineering education and my theological education and you get me. A person and a pastor with a perspective and a passion that will not allow myself or you to think that we must simply live with the problems of the day. 
and that there's nothing that can be done about it now. That this is just our lot in life. That is not who you have before you today. I will always challenge us to seek solutions to our problems with God as our guide and our helper. But first we must deal with real problems, not some safe rendition, but the real problem. Let me see if I can explain it this way. Have you ever marked up a dry erase board with a permanent marker? You can't erase the marker from the board until you accept the fact that you used a permanent marker. That requires a different solution than a dry erase marker. The regular eraser alone simply will not work. And once you accept that truth, you, you've done it. You've started trying to erase and you go, oh my God, I used a permanent marker. This eraser won't work. Once you accept that truth, then you can find the solution to deal with the real problem. And we deal with some of our society's problems like violence, homelessness, and poverty. You're frozen. The regular eraser is not working. We must accept the true cause of the problem. Is my internet? It glitched for a second, but you're back. The truth is that, thank you, many of problems in society started not only with the institution of slavery, but also with that Christian chapel above the slave dungeons. Many of the problems started with so-called followers of Jesus. Even the depiction of a white Jesus which reinforced the idea of supremacy. The problem started there and that now permeates society, causing a divide among human beings that has led to violence, immeasurable pain and suffering even today. This Black History Month, in this season when people are attempting to erase truth and rewrite history, when the Timuel Blacks have passed on and those who lived history are fewer and fewer, in a time when people want to ban books that tell the truth about some of the greatest crimes against humanity. This Black History Month, we need some truth telling, but it will take a solution. Let me back up. We need truth telling for the purpose of accepting that a permanent marker was used, but it will take a solution for the real problem and the problem I'm afraid began not only with slavery but with the perpetrators of slavery claiming to be followers of Jesus. You see Black History Month is American history as Pastor Sarah said Black people are brilliant, beautiful, bodacious, bold. We've accomplished great things in every area and discipline of society. Of course we have, but the reason we even celebrate this and, and for those who are irritated by the emphasis on one race of people, the reason it is notable is because we had to climb out of enslavement and oppression, come back from the back of buses and back doors of establishments. We had to prove that we were actually five-fifths human not three-fifths. And since the dry erase marker doesn't work, despite all these amazing accomplishments, there is still so many who hurt, are downtrodden, marginalized, angry, and violent. All are affected in some way because that regular eraser just doesn't erase one of the most horrendous crimes against humanity. And America has to deal with the truth across the board. In the book, Disrupting White Supremacy from Within, the authors Harvey Case and Gorsline, who are white, 
state that white supremacy, and I quote, is a system of individual, institutional, and societal racism in which whiteness and cultural and social practices associated with those deemed white are seen as normative and superior and through which white people are granted advantage status of various kinds. They go on to say, and here's the part that I believe has not been acknowledged enough by neither black, white, or any people, that white supremacy obviously had and continues to have devastating effects on peoples of color. And somebody say, and, because white people benefit from that which simultaneously harms others, it deeply malforms white people. Deep breath. It is seemingly a permanent marker that impacts us all. It's seemingly a permanent marker that is the root of many problems we face, whether we admit it or not and a regular eraser will not undo the stain. What can undo the stain? When I say that, I hear what can wash away my sins. We'll, we'll get there later. What can undo the stain in my wild, faithful imagination can be found in the text today, starting with today's scripture. And let me say this is a two-part sermon to be continued next week. But today's scripture, which is, is a scripture known for discipleship will give us some lessons that will help us in addressing the real problem. Full disclosure, I am also making the case for the return of our anti-racism work as a church. We made a commitment to begin an anti-racist congregation and to explore together what that will mean. And so I share with you today that we are preparing to pick that work back Let's look at today's scripture to see what discipleship following Jesus might really entail and what and how this might aid us in addressing white supremacy and its devastating impact on all people. Today's text in Luke is known as the calling of the first disciples. Verse one reads that once while Jesus was standing beside the lake, the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God. Here and throughout scripture, we find people with the hunger for God and for God's word. A hunger for God's word is a hunger for God and a hunger for truth. The people who had heard of Jesus and that he spoke God's word, so the crowd showed up whenever Jesus showed up to hear the truth. In our day, we're taught that the Bible is God's word. And if we truly believe that the Bible is God's word, I ask, where is the hunger? Where is your hunger? Are you seeking answers from God's word? Do you open your Bible? You see, I, I really wonder if those in the chapel in the castles opened the Bible and read the words of Jesus. I wonder if the preachers preached the words of Jesus and if not, did the people in the pews, regardless of what was preached, open their own Bible and read that Jesus said that he has sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners, to set the oppressed free. There's no way they read that. Are you, I'm talking to followers of Jesus, seeking to understand Jesus? Do you have a yearning to know what God might have to say? about what is happening, do you ask God for understanding? If you don't read your Bible, no blame here because scripture is tricky. It's written in a different context and culture, written in different languages and translated many times into different types of English written even with some biases and ungodly behaviors attributed to God. Yet it is our written resource and I believe is a source of God's guidance and wisdom. It takes some exegesis, 
and some deconstruction and some critical exploration and questioning and study, a plug for our Bible study in general, and the current study being led by Anna York. If any of you were there last, last Thursday, you know what I'm talking about. We are deconstructing the creation story. You see, we are intelligent beings, human beings, and the greatest commandment involves loving the Lord with all our minds. Our minds are not to be checked at the door for only the preacher to stimulate. We are to engage our own minds as followers, if we claim to be that, and be like the people in the text who were yearning and pursuing God's word. Our minds are not to be checked at the door, but are to critically examine the sacred text with prayerful hearts. And most importantly, from my experience, when we have a hunger for God and for God's word, seeking God's wisdom for the matters we face, I am so beyond confident that we will find that which we seek. Jesus says it this way in Matthew 7, ask and it will be given you, search and you will find, knock and the door will be open for you, for everyone who asks receives. And everyone who searches, Jesus says, finds. And everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. And so I encourage you today as you wrestle with whatever it is you're wrestling with, Pursue God for answers. When we want to hear from God, I'm a witness that God will indeed answer. Followers of Jesus, my prayer is that God restores within you a hunger, in particular a hunger to know Jesus. Study the words and the actions of Jesus and you will find a Jesus not who endorses hatred, discrimination or supremacy, but you'll find a Jesus who came to do justice for the oppressed, for the widow, the orphan, the left out, left that behind, the downtrodden, from the bent over widow to the thief on the cross. Jesus came to flip power and privilege on its head. Don't believe me, study the scriptures for yourself and meet a Jesus who came to set the captives free. There's no way that those followers of Jesus who orchestrated the transatlantic slave trade studied and followed the Jesus of the New Testament. And it's too late for them, but it's not too late for us. So Jesus sits down, amen, somebody, with, with words and then with a visual demonstration. In verse four, it says, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water let down your nets for a catch. And Simon asked, Master, we have worked all night long. You know the story, but have caught nothing. Yet, if you say so, I will let down my nets. And when they did this, they caught so many fish, the text says, that their nets were beginning to break. And this is one of my favorite parts. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to see. Jesus, the master teacher, demonstrates that partnership is part of discipleship. That following Jesus is not something that you do alone, but that you do it in community. Let's take that a step further, that, that implementing solutions to problems is not something that we do alone, but that we signal our partners to come and help. And I think that there's so much opportunity for us as a church to signal partners to come and help or to help our partners as we determine the future use of our building. That discussion will involve signaling partners to come and help. As we do this anti-violence work, we do so in community with partners of multiple faith traditions throughout the community to come and help. As we do the work of anti-racism, we need to do so while signaling partners to come and help. The idea that we can do things alone is not a concept of discipleship, but of supremacy, self-sufficiency. When we begin to act territorial or when there's a sense of competition or when we feel a sense of scarcity, that we need to protect 
what we have so others don't benefit from what God has given us. This is not the way of discipleship. Jesus didn't fill that, that net with, with fish and then say, Peter, keep it to yourself. Don't you call those partners. They're going to try to take part of what you have. No, he, he said, signal your partners. That's the way of discipleship. Doing God's work as demonstrated by Jesus in this scene involves signaling partners. Resist the notion that we have to do our work alone. That we should not ask for help. That is a notion that would have caused that boat to sink. And are we any different? The text teaches us that having a yearning and a hunger for God's word will help us. And the reality that we don't have to do our work alone, but that we should signal partners to help, that will help us. And, and what else will help us? Glad you asked. Verse seven says, and they, the partners came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knee, saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And when we yearn and seek God and begin to experience God, I'm talking about discipleship, following Jesus, there comes a time when we will be convicted of our sin and drawn to repentance. I have wondered in the midst of some of the greatest crimes against humanity, if the individuals involved were ever convicted in their individual hearts knowing that what they were doing is wrong. You see, sometimes the group dynamic is so powerful that everybody just moves with the group and does what the group is doing. That you can get caught up in the momentum of the power, that it's difficult to listen to that still small voice inside that is saying, this is wrong. Stop, repent, and turn away from this horrible sin. Peter in this moment is so moved that he falls to his knees and repents saying, God, Jesus, go away from me for I am a sinful man. No one said, Simon Peter, now fall to your knees and repent. Yet I will tell you that I believe that confession is good for the soul. That we must all examine our lives and admit our shortcomings. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And I'll have to admit that I don't preach this message often, but as a country and as a society and as individuals, if we're really going to deal with the crimes against Black people, people of African descent, then there needs to be not an erasure of the story, not a banning of books, but a repentance, a confession, and a repentance, an admission that it happened and that the damage continues today. Why a confession? Why repentance? Because a confession precedes a turning, an opportunity to move in the opposite direction. We see it in the text. Jesus says to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will be catching when they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed Jesus. Let's talk about leaving everything as I prepare to close. James Baldwin in his book, The Price of the Ticket says in his counsel to white people regarding white supremacy, re-examine everything. Go back to where you started as far back as you can and examine all of it. Travel your road again and tell the truth about it. Sing, he says, or shout or testify or keep it to yourself. But know from whence you came. This is said, I understand, from Baldwin, out of love. Baldwin says out of love, re-examine everything. Jesus says out of love, leave everything and follow me. And the hardest thing to leave behind is privilege. 
The hardest part of all of this work of anti-racism is not even the repentance. It is the leaving of power and privilege it has afforded. But if you think giving up white privilege is hard, imagine what it was for Jesus to give up son privilege. Philippians 2.5, Paul says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who thought he was in the form of, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. But he emptied himself, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. People ask, if nothing is too hard for God, why doesn't God just fix it? Just maybe while we're waiting on God, God is waiting on us. Maybe while God has given us everything we need to be more and more like Jesus, maybe God has given us opportunity after opportunity to pursue after God, opportunity after opportunity to study God's word and to yearn for an experience with God. Maybe God has given us chance after chance to confess and repent, to turn from our wicked ways. Maybe God has given us chance after chance to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. You see, I serve a God of another chance to do the work to restore the people who have been devastated for generations for a crime that we cannot erase with the regular eraser. And we have everything we need to get it right. And God is faithful, God will do it. And the reality is that there will always be a people, praise God, who will be seeking there will always be a people seeking justice. There will always be people committed to healing for there will always be a God who is a God of justice and a God of love. The prophet Amos says, let justice roll down like river and like water and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. And Dr. King added to it. And, and I agree that we as black people and brown people and white people and all people will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. So pick up your cross, follow the real Jesus, pursue God's truth. Learn about Jesus, the one you say you follow, repent of wrong. Receive God's healing and restoration, stand for truth. I often wonder where are our voices when they talk about banning books and talk about rewriting history. We watch it on the news and we say nothing. But it's time that we speak up for truth. God's truth can never be erased. Pastor Sarah told us black history is God's history and the truth will set you free. God's truth will prevail in the end and part two of this sermon will be next Sunday. God bless you. Mm -hmm.